Hi, Work Well listeners. I'm really excited to share that my book, Work Better Together, is officially out. Conversations with Work Well guests and feedback from listeners like you inspired this book. It's all about how to create a more human centered workplace. And as we return to the office for many of us, this book can help you move forward into post pandemic life with strategies and tools to strengthen your relationships and focus on your well being. It's available now from your favorite book retailer. As a Floridian, I'm no stranger to natural disasters. Even though I've been through quite a few hurricanes, I still get a ton of anxiety every time one hits. And I know I'm not the only one. In fact, climate change and the uncertainty about the health of our planet in the future can be a source of stress for many. How can you manage climate anxiety and also do your part to save the planet? It starts by taking action. This is the WorkWell podcast series. Hi, I'm Jen Fisher, Chief Wellbeing Officer for Deloitte, and I'm so pleased to be with you today to talk about all things well-being. I'm here with Heather White. She's an environmentalist, lawyer, and nonprofit executive with more than 20 years of experience in environmental law, policy, and advocacy. She's also the author, founder, and CEO of One Green Thing. Her goal is to spark joy in the climate action journey and build momentum towards widespread culture change that will drive climate solutions. Heather, welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Jen. It's a pleasure. So in your bio, you're listed as an environmentalist first and a lawyer second. So I want to know how you became so passionate about climate change. Oh, Jen, what a great question. So I, I grew up in East Tennessee, really close to the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Mm. So my earliest memories are hiking and camping with my parents. So from an early age, I was fascinated by the environment, environmental science, time outdoors. But also I knew that there was a legacy of nuclear waste contamination near Oak Ridge where I grew up. I also understood all the pressures of development. And so I thought environmental science would be a great place to start. But it was actually, so So I've been doing this climate action, environmental policy and law for more more than 20 years. It's 25 years now. Mm -hmm. But it was my kids and a conversation at the dinner table with my kids that prompted me to write this book and take my climate action to the next level. So let's talk about it. I, I want to get into some of the components of, of your book, but let's talk about more broadly kind of how climate change is impacting our mental health. Climate change is impacting our mental health in very significant ways, especially for young people. Mm -hmm. There was a survey in September of 2021, so it's a pretty recent survey, of 10,000 young people ages 16 through 25. And 47%, so nearly half, said that climate anxiety, which is defined by the American Psychological Association as the chronic fear of environmental doom, climate anxiety interfered with their daily life. So for nearly half. And one out of four did not want to have children of their own because they're so worried about the future that we're leaving them. So climate anxiety, and it was my kids who, who actually brought this to my attention when they started sharing about how they felt about the future we're leaving them. Uh, once I started kind of having when it, having these conversations around the dinner table, even as someone who's been involved in you know climate action for all this time, I I worked for Al Gore's campaign. I was an environmental lawyer. I've run two national environmental nonprofits. I worked on Capitol Hill. Knowing how young people and how concerned they are about the seven years we have to save the planet, um, that it is becoming. I would say it's a it's an epidemic that we aren't talking about. Yeah, and so you've been in this field for. A long time. So I guess talk to me about how um, that's evolved and changed and, you know, how are the other, how are the other generations feeling about it or are, are they not? I mean, I think they're not as potentially as anxious or worried about it, but um, like, talk to me a little bit about the evolution of all of this. Jen, that's such a great question. And before I get there, I'll, I'll tell you what happened to me. Mm 
And what happened to me is that in 2019, my older daughter, who was a freshman in high school, asked permission to walk out of school to participate in the Greta Thunberg Mm. climate strike. And I said, you know, of course you can go. And frankly, Jen, I was, you know, kind of proud of myself. I was like, yeah, you know, she learned from watching mom. You know, this is great. Apple doesn't fall far from the Absolutely. (laughs) Absolutely. And then my mom energy kind of kicked in um, and I checked the weather report. And I saw that there were supposed to be thunderstorms during the walkout. And I live in Bozeman, Montana, and it's actually pretty rare to, for us to have thunderstorms. My daughter had a heavy backpack and she had a trumpet. And so I just instinctively said, hey, why don't I pick you up um, from school and I'll, I'll drive you to the, to the protest site? And Jen, she said, wait, what? You're going to pick me up in a car, you know, at a walkout, but to a climate strike? You know, that doesn't make much sense, mom. Right. right. (laughs) Like what you're worried about, like the burden of my backpack and my trumpet. What about the future? Mm. And then she started crying Mm. and she said, mom, we are running out of time. You cannot leave the climate crisis all on our shoulders. Where is Gen X, which I'm a member of? Where are the baby boomers? Where are millennials? We feel so alone. And that was a game changing conversation because my younger daughter at the time too, Jen was like, yeah, that's exactly how I feel as well. And that's what prompted me to shift my work from solely advocacy um, and, and public lands to really diving into the research on this mental health aspect. So your question about generationally, how do we feel is a really important one. And one of the big takeaways I hope people get from this conversation, Jen, is for folks to ask the young people in their life how they feel about the future we are leaving them. And to a person, because I've had just just so you know, when people hear this story, I've had friends say to me, Jen, well, Heather, of course, your kids have eco-anxiety, you know, because they're your kids. They just picked it up. And when I say to them, talk to the young people in your life, to a person, it is a game-changing conversation. So one of the things I talk about in my book is this concept of think beyond your age. You know, intergenerational partnership is like a lot of syllables. (laughs) (laughs) Um, but, But we do. We need to start creating space for young people to share how they feel and for them to know that we're not alone. And that's not only that conversation prompted me to do the research on mental health impacts of the climate crisis, but also to create a this book, uh, and then a nonprofit, which is an invitation for more people to see themselves in the movement, because we need to get as many people as possible focused on sustainability in a meaningful way and to have that culture shift that we need for big climate policy solutions. Yeah. And I love the concept of seeing yourself in the movement, because I know, you know, speaking from my own experience, you know, climate change, it's, it's such a big issue. There's so much to know, so much to understand. And there's also so much uncertainty. So you kind of like, unless you know, you don't really even know where to start. <laughs> and and it's also because they're like, it's so big and so much uncertainty. I kind of feel like, I mean, is it is it possible to actually manage our anxiety and fear around it? Because it feels so, you know, like, what can one person do? And I know that that's what One Green Thing is about. (laughs) So so let's talk about that. Jen, that's so important how you broke that down. Because first, climate anxiety, worry, and intense worry about the future, that is a rational response Mm -hmm. to what's happening globally. And I think more and more people are connecting the dots between the extreme weather events we're seeing, whether it's the wildfires out in the West, whether it's the drought, you know, internationally, whether it's flooding internationally, we're seeing the rapid events and the extreme events that are causing traumas. Um, so we, so more and more people are connecting the dots. And of course, people are anxious and worried. But to your second point is that the issue is so overwhelming. We know that we need global policy solutions. So people are asking themselves, okay, I skipped at the straw. You know, like, does that make a difference? Right, right. You know, (laughs) what am I supposed to do? And here's the thing, Jen, is that environmentalists like me, we often start the conversation about climate with the what. 
here's the solution or have, you know, we have to electrify everything. We need to move to wind and solar as soon as possible. And oh, by the way, I love mushroom leather. It's a cool alternative. You should check it out. (laughs) Instead of, so we talk about the what, the do this, not that, instead of the who. Mm. And I think as somebody who does all the great work that you do and the research that you do on mental health, well-being, on teams, on connectivity, you know, and and other folks who are experts in behavior change understand, and the research shows that people are more likely to change their behavior when they see themselves yeah. in uh, and to uh, they connect the behavior to their identity. So, for example, if you decide you want to swim three times a week, you're more likely to swim if you say, you know, Jen, I'm a swimmer right? As opposed to I swim three times a week. And so that's why I created this assessment, which is kind of like Myers-Briggs or Enneagram or Strength Finder to help people see themselves in service. So I ask, who are you in service to the people you love? And then from there, here's how you can get involved in the movement in a way that connects with your identity and your unique talents and strengths. So I take this assessment and it gives me recommendations on how I can get engaged and how I can get involved, right? Exactly. The idea is that you adopt a daily practice of sustainability, a one green thing each day to try to ease eco-anxiety and shift the culture because Mm -hmm. we're all cultural change agents in our community. So that's kind of the big idea is that the daily practice isn't so much about, you know, counting your personal carbon calories. It's more about being a cultural change agent in your community. Um, So stepping back, there's there's seven different archetypes. The first is the adventurer, and this is the hands-on learner who is a risk taker and embraces the physicality of the outdoors. The second is the beacon, which is focused on social justice. These are the folks who are really comfortable behind the podium or with a bullhorn, right, in front of a group of people. Uh, The third is the influencer, which is all about people. And this person shows how they show, this this person shows up in service by connecting others and sharing the latest trends. Then there's the philanthropist. The philanthropist is the giver, the Mm -hmm. person who shows they care by sharing time and resources. Then there's the sage that's spiritually connected to nature and focused on the moral case for climate action. And then finally, there's, well, not finally, then there's the spark, which is the cheerleader, you know, the plus one. And this is a lot of people have relief when they find out that they're the spark, because without someone who says, sure, I'm in, there's no movement, you know, without the plus one, there's no movement, Mm -hmm. but you don't even have to consider yourself an environmentalist to be a spark. And then finally, there's the wonk who's the problem solver, which frankly, a lot of people in the environmental community are, they're all about the data and the technology, but they can translate those complex issues into ways that people can understand. Yeah. And I think for me, what I love about the archetypes is exactly what you said, because you know, there, there's so much to know. There's so much to feel like you need to know and understand, and you break it down into a way that you fit into an archetype that you don't necessarily need to know and understand every single little nuance, detail, and piece of data. So it makes it very empowering to those of us that aren't experts in this area. That is my hope. And that's the feedback that I've been given from a lot of folks who've gone through through the assessment and picked up the book and have been become part of our community. Because Jen, I think it's important for people to understand you you can't be all things to all people in this right. movement, right? And I have friends that are very uncomfortable with the idea of protesting. It's mm. just not their thing. You know, they're they're not beacons. But when they realize they're a spark and they can show that they're part of this community by going to a nature documentary with a friend joining a friend who's planning a, a river cleanup, um, learning more about how to lobby Congress from another friend, they can they can see themselves in this movement. You don't have to be all things to all people. It's kind of behavior change 101. It's it's do one small thing a day. Um, and that, you know, that that does add up to big impacts. You are absolutely right, Jen. And the data actually shows that. So yeah. I, I say to people, look, it's not about your individual carbon footprint. It's not the, score, it's not the scorekeeping. It's not, yeah. it's not the yeah. scorekeeping. It's not about your individual carbon footprint. It is more about the culture shift that we need for the big solutions to take hold. 
That said, according to Project Drawdown, another terrific resource for climate solutions, if individuals and households take daily action, they can contribute up to 25% of the carbon emission reductions we need globally. So it does add up uh, yeah. collectively. And then the culture change can help us get to that other 75%, which is what we really need, even with big pieces of legislation that have passed, like the Inflation Reduction Act, which has all kinds of incentives for climate solutions. If we don't have the culture ready and willing to accept and implement those solutions, it's not going to work. So that's why this practice is important. And then as a well-being person, I think that you can also see that this daily practice, thinking of it like meditation or prayer right. or yeah. running or journaling, it can bring more joy into your life. It can be fun as we're working toward a greener, healthier future. Absolutely. And I, I that's why I love it too. And I and I love the fact that you tie it to joy, right? Because it, you know, it, it, again, I, I continue to go back to my own experience where I was like, well, you know, there's not really much I can do as an individual. And that was absolutely the wrong mindset. <laughs> um, but, you know, actually then changing my mindset to understanding what my role is and what I can do and, you know, what I'm capable of doing and how I can be proud of that, right? I am making, you know, a contribution to something much bigger than me, regardless of how small it might feel. Um, and just, so I think there's part of it too, that, you know, along with behavior change comes, you have to have the mindset change too. Right. And so you have to give yourself that, you know, that permission or that grace to be like, okay, you know, I, I, I'm doing, I'm doing what I can and it's going to have it, you know, seeing it as part of the bigger impact, which brings you joy. So I love it. <laughs> oh, thank you, Jen. And that was just a great description of the intent behind um, a tool I have in the book, which is called the Joy Tracker. Yep. So you can keep track of your one green things, this daily practice, and you might find, you know, composting <laughs> was a fun experiment, but it's not, but not for you. <laughs> <laughs> and you want to sign up for a service, you know, and you're going to build that into your budget over the next six months, you know, or you may find out, oh my gosh, I love calling my member of Congress. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew it was that fun? Or you may find out that taking a walk um, outside is something that you want to make a daily habit. You want to get your green hour every day, and mm -hmm. that's really great for your mental health and your sense of purpose. Or if you want to talk to your congregation about getting solar panels, you know, uh, where where you where you meet, th that may be what gives you joy. But the idea is you don't have to do it all, but it is that daily practice and and creating that culture shift that we need. Now, what's interesting is that you know I live with teenagers which, um, Jen, they provide a lot of feedback, <laughs> <laughs> which I know, I know is good and helps me grow, Jen. I understand that. Um, but you know, one of the things is this idea of like, are you giving people a pass mom with mm -hmm. this daily practice? And absolutely not. It's not a pass. It's an invitation. It's an invitation because this is the biggest challenge of our lifetimes. It is globally. We have seven years to make the reductions in carbon emissions that we need globally. Um, and, and that's significant rapid change that can only happen if all of us get involved and tap into our unique strengths and talents. And we're not going to get there by yelling. Right. You know, we're going to get there by inviting people in and helping right. them see themselves in, in this role. So that's been a, a pretty interesting conversation that I've had with a lot of folks, especially young people who understand the urgency. And right. that's why I try to tell older generations to make space for young people to be heard and make a commitment that you're going to help them. And one of the things I talk about, Jen, that I thought you would appreciate a lot is this I, idea of and I have exercises in the book, this idea of what type of ancestor do you want to be? What mm -hmm. is your personal legacy? And in the book, I ask you to envision what 2050 could look like if we get it right. You know, <laughs> how amazing could it be if we had rooftop gardens everywhere and, you know, mass transit powered by by clean energy and we put equity at the center of design and and how we connect with each other how how could that what could it be like yeah. and then i ask you to go backwards and start thinking about who in your life maybe someone you didn't even know it doesn't have to be a family member or it could be a mentor who created an incredible opportunity for you mm 
that made the life you're living now possible. You know, it could be someone who made a medical advancement. It could be someone who created a right for you to get married, you know, a right for you to, you know, uh, vote. Um, the, the, the reality is there are people that didn't even know us in previous mm-hmm. generations that wanted our life to be better. They intentionally thought of us. And then I ask you in the book as the, part of this exercise to fast forward after you've reflected on someone who's changed your life, you know, it's 2050 and you're meeting with a teenager and you're the ancestor. What are they going to thank you for? What are they going to wish you had known? And I think that's an important entry point when we're talking about climate action is for people to to think about this intergenerational value and this idea of thinking beyond your age. And it's really powerful to kind of think back, you know, that there there are rights that we have or things that we have access to now, or the world is a certain way, a positive, <laughs> for, for positive reasons, because of somebody's actions in the past or a group of people's actions in the past. I just think that that's so powerful. And we don't, we don't walk around in our daily lives thinking about that. You know, when we go through our daily lives and it is, you know, somewhat easy to live in this world, I say somewhat very intentionally, (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, but there are a lot of things that are afforded to us today because of actions that other people took. Um, But we don't think about that as we move through our lives on a day-to-day basis. Unfortunately, maybe we should think about it more often. And that's one of the things that I try to instill uh, with the organization, just this idea of trying to be more intentional and thinking about our legacy. And, And actually, you know, it's not just a field good exercise. There is social science to back this up. And in Japan, there's a movement called the future design movement where members of municipalities as part of their strategic planning exercise have people role play as future generations when they're coming up with their long-term vision. And um, more and more, we're seeing this as an approach to thinking about how we plan for the future. And I think that's really important. And one of the things that in in your work that really inspires me, Jen, is this idea of human sustainability. And when we think about ESG, Mm -hmm. making sure that the S, the social part of the ESG, considers mental health and well-being. Oh, you are you are singing my song. I want to shout that from the rooftops because I, you know, I just if if we don't if we don't have well humans. I, I, you know, so much of this isn't possible, but if we do have well humans, I, there's, there's almost nothing that we can accomplish. And I, I believe that in my heart. And so, um, human sustainability has to be at the core of this. So thank you for bringing that up. It absolutely does. And it's actually something that I do refer to that might be helpful for, for folks to put this idea of climate anxiety and eco-anxiety, other terms are climate grief or soul mm. nostalgia, kind of keep that in, and put that in context. So one of the things I write about uh, and I found through my research is what I call the eco-anxiety trifecta. And these are the three factors that contribute to what I am calling an epidemic that we aren't really talking about. And the first is, um, it's actually anxiety. So Gen Z has such high rates of anxiety that the Surgeon General has issued a warning Mm -hmm. about it and that it's one of the most significant health crises that we've seen in young people for decades. Some of it related to the pandemic, some of it related to destigmatizing mental health, but most mental health professionals are saying that we really are in a crisis with just anxiety. The second is chronic loneliness. And and Jen, I know you know all about chronic loneliness, but in a recent survey, six out of 10 baby boomers said they experienced chronic loneliness Mm -hmm. and eight out of 10 Gen Zers experienced chronic loneliness. So young people today are lonelier than the elderly. Um, and then the third is the hyper awareness of the climate crisis, and I think this is important, Jen, because a lot of a lot of times when we're talking about young people, we talk about social media, mm-hmm. and understandably, we talk about our concerns about addiction and the negativity, and we talk about uh, body image and bullying. But the reality is, for this generation, they are hyper aware of the pain and suffering of the climate emergency because they're sharing in real time 
the flooding in Pakistan, wildfires and the skies turning orange in San Francisco, yeah. drought in Kenya, they see in real time from other young people and they're really worried. So as we're putting the context of social uh, in the ESG, environmental social governance, we need to understand that the mental health and well-being is not, quote, soft. Right. It is absolutely critical as we create this better, positive, more regenerative vision for the future. So well said. I feel like we could have an entire conversation <laughs> <laughs> just, just about that. And there's just there's so much more that needs to be said and done there. Um, but we're talking about it, and and that's a that's a good first step. And and I agree with you and applaud. Um, our current Surgeon General in so many ways on his focus related to loneliness, mental health, and now um, you know well-being in the workplace and the impact that work is is having on our mental health and well-being and the the engines, the positive engines that workplaces can be for things like mental health and well-being, but also climate change, sustainability. Um, you know, all of that is within his framework. And so I really applaud him for for doing that. I'm a big fan of his. We went to high school together. <laughs> Are you, oh, that is so fabulous. This idea of balance, this idea of contributing to a better society, this idea of using influence and power and capital to make change and help others and put compassion at the center is what young people expect now. Yeah. It, it absolutely is. And I, you know, I am in that, uh, that uh, Gen X generation, but I 100% wholeheartedly agree with them. <laughs> yes. And, and I think there's an opportunity to learn. Yeah. And the, when I talk about this idea of, you know, think beyond your age and be an awesome ancestor in the context of climate climate anxiety and climate action. One of the things I do is I have a discussion guide that's a available with the nonprofit One Green Thing. But one of the things I try to do is not only create space for older generations to listen to young people about their anxiety about the future, but also to make sure that we share stories intentionally of resilience. Resilience we've seen in our families and our communities that we've seen globally we have seen significant changes for the better in our lifetime and talking about that, even though there's so much still to be done. I think that's important. So it's not a sense of false hope, but making sure right. young people know that we've seen the big changes and we forget to share those stories with them. We do. And I am a, a big advocate for the the power of hope, you know, real mm -hmm. hope, right? Pointing to those things that can actually, that that are actual fact, right? But that can help us be more hopeful because a lot about the world right now is doom and gloom and understandably so. We, But we do have to search for and share those those stories and those moments that, that can bring us hope because that's what spurs, you know, continued action in my mind. So um, I, I wear a bracelet around my wrist that actually says hope. It is on my wrist 24 hours a day. <laughs> Jen, um, I love that. I love it. That's so powerful. And that also is at the root of this book and yeah. this mission to tackle eco-anxiety. The reality is we have all the climate solutions we need. We even have the money. You know, We need to distribute it to the global south so they can implement these solutions. But we have the money. What is missing is the political will. Okay. And that only shifts when we all take action. Agreed. Agreed. So one thing I want to shift back to in your book, um, because I love superpowers. Yeah. <laughs> and you talk about service superpower. I know you touched on this a little bit when it comes to service, but can you dive a little bit more deeply into that? Just because I love this concept. Oh, thank you, Jenna. And I think when I was coming up with this assessment, I tried to figure out what what was the right way for people to see themselves in climate action. And I decided to call the archetypes service superpowers yeah. because how you show up for others is unique and so important for us to create that healthier, greener, more equitable future that we can we can do. And so um, the, the, the sage, the beacon, the wonk, right. these different profiles, I call your service superpower and the way that you activate it is through this daily practice in a way that works for you. 
So if you're a beacon, you may want to join the kids at the climate strike. <laughs> you know, you may want to help plan of uh, you know, a lobby day. If you're a wonk, you may want to share articles about uh, you know, how you can get community solar in your neighborhood. If you are a um, sage, you might want to have an intergeneral intergenerational conversation in your faith community about how important it is for us all to get involved. Or you may want to meditate outside or share a poem that's meaningful for you. The idea is we all have a way that we show up and show our love for others that's unique and different. And we need to unlock that creativity and that service mentality to create the better vision of the future. And the way you bring that to life is your superpower. Yes, exactly. I love that. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So the idea of the superpower is that we we are the hero. We're all the heroes the earth mm-hmm. needs right now and our future loved ones, the people we haven't met yet. Uh, that are going to hold us accountable and hopefully will thank us for the actions that we took starting with that first small step. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about the role of, of organizations and workplaces in the fight against climate change. Um, what, what do you believe the role can be, should be, needs to be um, in all of this? I think the role of work is a powerful one because it is a powerful community that you have. I think there's opportunities within your teams to think of your service superpowers and how you can connect with each other and how you can work towards more sustainability. When it comes to climate denial, the fact is is that the vast majority of Americans know that climate change is real and they believe the science the vast majority, more than 80%. When it comes to young people across party lines, young people know that climate change is the number one issue that they're facing. And they see the intersectionality of climate change as, as it relates to racial justice, economic justice, healthcare, you name it. But, but climate is the spear point of what they're focused on. So I think that when it comes to climate denialism, I think the important is, is just you just keep saying the truth and take action. But I wouldn't worry too much about convincing people who don't agree. I would, um, for folks who, who don't believe it's real, you can start talking about legacy and what do you think that we mm-hmm. are, what are we leaving the next generation and encourage them to talk to young people. Yeah, I, I I love that. Um, you know, especially thinking about the workplace and and organizations as as a community. Um, I I really like that concept. So I, I have a question here that I was going to ask you that says, how can parents talk to their kids about climate change and encourage encourage sustainable behaviors? But I feel like I need to switch that around and say, how can kids talk to their parents <laughs> about climate change and encourage sustainable behaviors? Jen, I wish you could see the smile <laughs> on my face right now. That's exactly right. There are resources out there about parents talking to their kids, but kids already know. Yeah. They already know. And so for kids, um, it is tell, you know, at these family conversations, you know, around the dinner table, if there's holidays, gatherings that you're together, ask to be heard and mm-hmm. share how you feel. And I do have this discussion guide where you can ask, you know, what have you seen? Um, what changes have you seen in your life? Tell me about a story of resilience in our family or in our community. And I need you to know that I think it's very important. This is a kid talking. I think it's very important for you to commit to me to take action every day towards a better future. And you know what I think, Jen? I think the more kids have these intentional conversation with older generations, I kind of see it as the anti-smoking campaign. If Mm -hmm. you're a Gen Xer, you may remember, but I vividly remember in the fourth grade, a nurse came in with a smoker's lung and a healthy lung, Mm -hmm. an actual lung. Okay. (laughs) And I talked to my grandparents when I saw that and said, you need to stop smoking. And they did, 
Jen, they did. Now, I'm sure there were other factors like their doctors telling them to do that, but there was also a culture shift because more of their friends were quitting. Yeah. But there is a power in young people um, being being heard and so and taking up that space. And we're seeing more and more of them having a seat at the table. The United Nations has a new program where they're not only inviting young people in to quote listen, but actually have them at the table and even supporting them directly as fellows to be part of the solution. But yeah. yes, kids need to talk to their parents about climate change and and parents and grandparents need to ask the young people they love about how they feel about the future. And it's a game changing conversation. I love that. I love that. So Heather, I'm going to end by asking you, what what are the small actions that you personally take on a daily basis to to fight climate change? And, and maybe I'll add on to that to say, and what feedback do you get from your kids on it? <laughs> oh, great question. Great question. The, the first, and this is the least sexy climate solution you will ever hear, Jen, and it happened here right now, um, menu planning. <laughs> Ah, okay. uh, we plan out our meals to try to reduce food waste and food waste globally contributes 8% of carbon mm -hmm. emissions. So like being mindful of your food and that way planning for your, your, your meals and how you're going to use leftovers is really powerful. My kids, we have what we call a fend night We everyone fends for themselves <laughs> where we have to use leftovers. And I think they think it's fun, but I'll get that feedback later. <laughs> <laughs> they have just, that's the first thing. The second thing is I buy carbon offsets when I travel and you just need to dig a little bit to make sure that you're getting reports back about how your money is being invested. But that's something that um, I appreciate because obviously tra air travel is part of what I need yeah. to do with my work. Um, the third thing I do is compost. Um, and I'm the worst gardener, the world's worst gardener, but I love composting, even though it's frozen right now here in Montana. Um, <laughs> but that gives me a lot of joy. The other thing I do is I try to walk uh, as much as I can instead of uh, ride my bike. And then um, the other thing that I do is try to get outside every day, even if it's negative eight degrees, which often it is here in Montana. <laughs> You're, Just for you're a welcome few minutes. here in Miami anytime. <laughs> Thank you, Jen. Oh my gosh, I love Miami. Jen. You need to and thaw out. <laughs> and one of my favorite quotes comes from um, the author Anne Lamott. Mm, yeah, and she says, "Go outside, look up, secret to life." Love it. But there's all kinds of great resources. Well, Heather, thank you so much for, for being on the show today. I learned so much. This was such an engaging conversation. I love the topic. It's a topic we haven't had before, and I know uh, so many people are going to get a lot out of it. Thank you so much for the opportunity. And I'm going to say, I'm not going to say so much again. Thank you, Jen, <laughs> uh, for, for the opportunity and for your wonderful work. It inspires so many people and keep doing what you're doing. Well-being needs to be at the center of our family conversations, of our work conversations, and our vision for the future. I'm so grateful Heather could be with us today to talk about climate change and its impact on our mental health. Thank you to our producers, Rivet360, and our listeners. You can find the WorkWell podcast series on Deloitte.com, or you can visit various podcatchers using the keyword WorkWell, all one word, to hear more. And if you like the show, don't forget to subscribe so you get all of our future episodes. If you have a topic you'd like to hear on the Work Well podcast series, or maybe a story you would like to share, please reach out to me on LinkedIn. My profile is under the name Jen Fisher or on Twitter at JenFish23. We're always open to your recommendations and feedback. And of course, if you like what you hear, please share, post, and like this podcast. Thank you and be well. The information, opinions, and recommendations expressed by guests on this Deloitte podcast series are for general information and should not be considered as specific advice or services.